What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Don't forget, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, make sure you share the video, and leave a comment. I think that uh, you'll probably like this interview. In the past, I've spoken about Ricky Fackrell, who was a SAC gang member that killed you know, two other prisoners in federal prison. So today I get an email, and when I get the email, the dude says, hey, man, I know that dude. And he, you know, talked a little bit about his situation and him being in prison. And I was like, you know what? I'm calling this dude. So I called the dude back probably, you know, about an hour ago. And now we're doing the video. So Brian, man, I'm going to let you come on the show. Tell the people who you are, where you're from, and talk a little bit about your life and how you ended up in prison. All right. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Brian Person. Uh, I, uh, I originate from Fresno, California. I live in Orem, Utah now. Uh, at the age of 12, I was put in foster care. And uh, was already experiencing meth and experimenting with it and uh, not even knowing how to do it, just eating it because I didn't know how to do it. And I got it off my mom's dresser. And uh, by the time I was 14, I was a full blown drug addict. Uh, it couldn't keep me in a foster home longer than a couple of weeks so I could get some new clothes and on the run again. Uh, I'd go find my mother. My mother would leave it at her friend's house uh, for days at a time. Anyway, she did this at one time when I was 15. I was a runaway. Uh, I seen my mom riding her motorcycle down the street. I flagged her down. Uh, long story short on that, I hop on the back of the bike. She takes me to one of her friend's house. And when she takes me there, it's late at night. I'm cold. I don't have a jacket. I was on her motorcycle. And we're there for about an hour. And she says she needs to go get cigarettes. She's done this several times. So uh, I'm telling her I'm going with you. You're not leaving me here. So anyway, what does she do? She leaves. And I tell the lady, I was like, she, she, she's not coming back. Well, she doesn't come back for a month. By this time, I don't know what it was about this family. I don't know what it was about these people, but they convinced me to stay. And uh, I got clean off meth for a little while, lived with these people as a runaway. And uh, we moved to Utah. And I've been here since I, ever since uh, 15 to 18. I was extradited a few times. 18, I've been stuck here. Uh, I've been to prison eight times, um, everything from arson, temporal evidence, burglary, theft, to first degree aggravated robbery, which is a five to life in our state, and a gun charge. Um, I want to I want to talk to you a little bit about your situation with your mom. You okay. said at the age of twelve years old, that's the first time that you did meth. You took it off your mother's um, dresser, right? Yeah. So you take the meth off there. What was your mom doing? Was she a biker chick? Well, I mean, tell us a little bit more about that. Okay, so uh, my mom was a single mom uh, trying to raise me and my sister. And uh, yeah, she was a, my mother was a featherwood. She rode a motorcycle and she hung out with Peckerwoods. My uncle was a Peckerwood. And uh, in California, that's a big deal. You know, you don't, you're not just a Peckerwood and you're not just a featherwood. You have to earn your feathers. You have to earn your tattoos. My mom earned her feathers. She was a full fledged featherwood. Um, and uh, that was the lifestyle I was thrown into. And so her boyfriends uh, selling dope, uh, beating my mom, uh, staying out all night, days at a time, leaving me and my sister home alone. Well, one day I was watching cops, man, and I seen them. This was back in the 90s. This was 90, 92, 92, I think. Uh, he tasted the meth and he said, oh, yeah, that's meth. It made a crazy face. So I went in and my mom's dresser had on the mirror, there was dust, and I just ran my hand across it and licked my hand. And okay, this is this is what they see, have on TV. This is what they're busting them with, and it kept me up, and uh, I liked that. And so I found the stash, and I I take a little bit at a time, just you know, little crumbs, whatever, and trying to give it to my friends and shit, and uh, didn't get busted by that, but. It led me to, by the time I was 14, I was a full-blown drug addict. My house got condemned. We had no running water, no food, no electricity. My house got condemned, and my mother was nowhere around. It was just me and my sister. I watched them tear my house down. And uh, the way we got put in foster care was my sister was tired of it. And uh, she went to the band director at her school and told him, hey, look, man, my brother's going to the gas station pumping gas and washing car windows for change so we can have food at night. We have no electricity. We have no running water. So he, he called CPS and the police and uh, 
they found me at my very first girlfriend's house. <laughs> I was 12 years old and living there with her in her brother's room and was put in foster care. So you go to foster care, right? And yeah. you continue a drug addiction while you're in foster care? Or are you like, you know what? I got a family here. Maybe I should do the right thing. Or are you like, man, screw that. I don't want to be here. I want to be with my mom. I don't want to live like this. Yeah, yeah. Foster care was not for me. There was there was no way they could keep me in a foster home. No matter what they tried to do, no matter what they said, I wanted to be with my mother. So I would take it upon myself to run away. And I got good at it. At first, I wasn't very good at it. I was kind of scared. You know, maybe a couple times I'd come back to the foster home the next day crying. I was a, young, I was a little kid. I got good at it. That's and sad. Good. Yeah. yeah. And so I would run away and go to every one of my mom's spots and ask her friends, hey, man, you see my mom? You see my mom? Can you call my mom? And uh, I'd do that until I found my mom. And then I'd be with my mom for a couple of weeks and get busted, uh, you know, and be put back in another foster home. Not busted, like go to jail or DT or nothing. Just get caught, something stupid, and put back in the foster home. So, you know, you know, Brian, one of my messages on my show, man, is for parents too, man, to be real fathers, real leaders, real men, women to be mothers. I tell people, you know, on my Sunday night lives, man, go give your son a hug tonight. Go kiss your daughter. What does it feel yeah. like, man, for a 12 year old, for his mom to leave for a month? Uh, by that time, I was used to her leaving me at places. And my very first, the next day when I woke up the next morning, I told the lady, I told which is my mom now. I, I told my mom that I'm sorry, I can't be here. I gotta go. I gotta go. I need. To, I have to go get high. And she's like, No, just wait. You know, I'll order some food. Her husband had two towing companies. They had a very nice house, four kids, three girls and a boy. And I said, Okay. I don't know why, but I said, Okay. It was the nicest house I'd ever been in in my life. There was two doors to come into the house, and I was blown away by it. And so I was like, all right, I'll stay and eat some food. And uh, I ate some food and one day turned into two. And I was telling my mom, I was like, look, I got to go. You know, she's like, oh, just stay. Not a word from my mother for three, at least a month. By that time, this family has taken me to Disneyland. My brother's beating me up, holding me down so my sisters can pull my hair. I'm calling her mom. This is my brother. These are my sisters. This is my family. This is where I'm staying. So when my mom did show back up and try to take me with her, I told her, I'm not going with you. I'm moving to Utah. She tried to tell me no. And I said, you can't tell me no. I'm a ward of the state. You ain't got nothing to say about it. And I know you ain't going to call the cops on me because you're not a rat. So I'm, I'm gone. I'm leaving. So at 15, I moved to Utah. The Utah with this family and sounds like they're good people, but do you, you, you spiral into this drug addiction? Does it fester? Does it keep growing? What happens when you get to Utah? So when I get to Utah, uh, I'm not using meth at this time. You know, I'm with this family in Fresno. I'm not using meth. A few times here and there I did, um, but not like I'm not strung out like I was. I get to Utah, and uh, at first it's just smoking weed, man. And, you know, a drug addict can find it. I don't care where you're at. You can find it in the church. I know you can. If you're a drug addict, you're going to find it. And so, you know, being a drug addict, finally I was like, you know what? I'm going to go find some dope. I'm going to get high. And that quick, and it just spiraled instantly. It was it was it was instantaneous, right back into where I was. Yeah, I didn't know you were from Fresno. I thought you were originally from Utah, but you you leave Fresno, you go to Utah, and now you know you got these people, man. They're reaching they're reaching out to you, but maybe from your pain and, and you know the prior addiction, man. It's crazy for a twelve year old for someone to come on and say, man, at twelve years old I was getting high on meth, bro. I, you know I'm sorry to hear that, and I hope that. There are, I mean, obviously there's probably other kids in the same position right now. And your story is just like, it's shocking to me, to say the least, right? So you're in Utah, but you end up going to prison, right? How old are you the first time you go to prison? Uh, I am 21. First time. First time I went to prison was in 2000 and 2001. 2001. So 91, 81, 91, 2001. Yeah, I was, I was 21 years old. What do you go to prison for? Uh, the first time I went to prison was for arson, tampering with evidence, burglary, and theft. The tampering with evidence was because I tried to I tried to uh, conceal uh, my tracks of, of robbing, 
this uh, this vehicle, hitting the slick for my little brother by by burning the car up to get my fingerprints off. And uh, so I, that's when arson comes in. Uh, then they got me for burglary on the car because there was over five thousand dollars worth of stuff in it and and a theft charge. And that's and initially I did 18 months in county jail. I fought it. I uh, pled guilty and uh, I got uh, I got uh, 18. I got a year in county jail, but I'd already served six months. And so they dropped a whole bunch of little tiny little charges that really they kept the good ones and, and threw out the other ones. And that was my plea agreement. And uh, so I did 18 months. And I'd never done any kind of serious time. I'd done a, a month here and there, uh, but nothing like this. So I was, I was kind of, I was kind of shocked. And and I was 19. I was uh, I was 19. And so I became a product of my my environment in the county jail, you know, before I went to prison. So I got. You're 19. There. You're 19 when you catch the charge, but 21 when you get sentenced and go to prison. I'm 19 when I catch the charges and I spend a year and a half in jail. So then I get out and I'm only out for three months and or four months, excuse me. And uh, I get arrested in September of 2001 and I'm right back. So right back. And then eventually, man, you end up doing 10 straight years in Utah State Prison, right? Yeah. My third time, my third time in prison. Uh, so I went for the arson temple with evidence, burglary and theft because I ran from probation. So I went to prison. They only gave me, uh, they only gave me nine months the first time. So I get out, I go on the run, I'm getting high, I'm doing all that shit. I go back for an escape charge for running from the halfway house. So then they give me, I think it was six, to nine months, something like that. Release me. My third time in prison, I get released. Uh, and, uh, I end up, I end up committing this robbery carjacking this dude and shooting him because he tried to take the gun. We struggled for the gun, shot him in the wrist. Nah, I want to stop you. You robbed this guy, you're carjacking him, right? What are you going to yeah. do, steal his car and sell it? So what had happened was, uh, it's crazy, man. There's a waterfall in Ogden Canyon. I was climbing it. I fell head over feet. No, no repelling gear, nothing like that. And I was about 50, 60 feet high, like a rag doll down to the water, knocked me out cold. Anyways, I got uh, 10 stitches in the palm of my hand. I messed up my leg pretty bad. Well, I go, I walk to this hotel, which is pretty far away, looking for my little brother. He's not there. So as I'm starting to walk back, I see dude, I see, I see dude parked on the river, and I, I know what time it is. I know he's a homosexual because that's where they park. Nothing against them. I don't have nothing against none of that shit. You are who you are. You do what you do. Anyway, he's parked on the river, and I said, "This is my lit." So I walk up to his window and I ask him for a cigarette. He has a half a tank of gas. Who I know he can give me a ride home. He gives me a cigarette. I'm like, hey man, I don't, I can't walk up the hill. Give me a ride home. He's like, yeah, hop in, hop in. And he asked me if I got any drugs. And I told him, look, man, I, I got no drugs if you ain't got no money. And at this time, I'm busted ass broke. You know, wearing the same socks for a week at a time, broke. You know, living on, a, sleeping on somebody's couch, and then finally telling me, look, man, you know what I mean? You can, you gotta, you gotta go. Like, all right, sorry, man. I've overstayed my welcome, you know. Broke. That's how broke I am. I don't have no dope. So I figure he's got money. So what am I going to do? I'm going to rob this dude. Take him up to this spot in the canyon and uh, tell him, let's walk down this little trail. So we walk down this little trail. My hand stitches, busted ass leg, and we're under this bridge. And uh, I got the gun in my side right here. I ain't never shot nobody. I ain't never pulled no gun out on nobody like this, but I'm broke and I'm struggling and I need some dope. That's all I need, some dope. So I got my back to him and I got a button up shirt on, but you can't see the gun in the holster. It's a 22 Ruger single six revolver. I pull it out and I turn on him and I look at him and I say, look, don't turn this robbery into a murder. Just give me all your shit and I'll let you go. And he hit the ground. Threw out his wallet, keys to the car, everything. Pick it up. I turned to leave, and he jumps up off the ground and comes after me. So I turned on him again, and I said, if you take another step, man, I'm going to have to kill you. And I look back. There's rocks and everything. 
I take a couple steps back and I almost fall. So I look back and here he is right in my face. And he grabs the barrel of the pistol. And I'm going to tell you, when I say we were face to face, you can, you can put a piece of paper between our noses. I know we were thinking the exact same thing. Either I shoot and kill him or he's going to take this gun and shoot and kill me. So I try to yank the gun out of his hand. And when I yank the gun out of his hand, it discharges, shoots him in the, in the wrist. And um, he puts his hand to his chest and starts screaming and running the other way toward, in, to the river. Well, before that, he pulled his hand away to turn and he had a white shirt on. and There was blood all over his chest. And I thought I shot him in the chest. I freaked out when he jumped in his car and took off. You jump in his car, you take off. You say you freak out. So in that moment, are you just like, are you panicking? Like, oh, shit, I'm going to kill this dude. I'm going to prison forever. Or are you thinking, man, I got, I want to go get high. What's going through your mind at that moment? I think I'm thinking that I'm hit. I'm going to prison for life. I'm never going to get out. I pull up to, to one of the dope spots. I get out of the car. I know there's just girls and shit at this house right now. And uh, so I, I go up there and I knock on the door and I'm like, hey, man, I need inside. So they let me in. They're like, what happened? I was like, I just need you to help me fix up my hand. I had my hand wrapped from the hospital. Fix up my hand because uh, I don't want to leave blood in the car because I got to get rid of this car now. And this girl walks out with me. And she's like, what's going on? I said, look, I can't tell you. I said, but you might see me on the news tonight. Just watch the news. She's like, oh, my God, she's freaking out. What's going on? I said, I can't tell you, man. I don't want to put you in that position because if the cops know that I came here, I want you to be able to say you don't know nothing. Because I'm not going to tell you nothing. You just have to watch the news. That's what happens. I take off from there. And from the time I committed the robbery and shot him to the time I was in handcuffs was probably a span of, we'll say, an hour. I had undercover cars follow me. I had the police chase me. i um, driving through the neighborhoods. I just need to get away. I need to get to my house so I can park this car, put a tarp over it, put it on the flatbed and get rid of it. I pa I'm so high, strung out, I pass my house and meet with a cop. He's going north or he's going south and I'm going east. And I see him and I hit it. And uh, I finally cut a corner after about 10 or 12 blocks. I finally cut a corner. I think I got him, lost him. And there was another one coming straight at me on a, on a side street. I had another corner, jumped out of the car while it was still running and took off. Running. My adrenaline was going. Let me, let, me, Go let me ask you this, Brian. How much money did you get? You robbed the guy. How much money did you get? $3 and some change. Wow, I want that to resonate. I want people that are watching this show right now. There's some young kid out there, man. He's doing robberies, right? And I want him to think like, wow, man, $3. You got 10 years for three. You did 10 years of your life in prison for $3. But we're going to get to that in a minute. The other part is you didn't intend to shoot this dude, but you felt like you had to. You you were just going to rob him and leave and not have to shoot him, right? I mean, that was your intention, right? Right. right. But right. unfortunately, sometimes when we do things, things that we don't plan – tend to happen a lot where someone might try to grab the gun or someone might try to run away. And when they try to grab the gun or something, now you're in a position that you never thought you'd be in. And now your life's on the line. Now you have to ask yourself, what is your life worth? He could have took yeah. the gun. He could have killed you. You could have killed him and ended up with a life sentence, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's what I was looking at. I, I was given a five to life. And, you know, people ask me, I've had been asked that question. I, I can't tell you how many times, how much money did you get? That's how three dollars and some change, but in reality, I didn't get no money. I didn't get no money. What I get? I got ten years in prison. What that come with? My mother died while I was in prison. I had a nephew die while I was in prison. My father died while I was in prison. So, what did I get? Really, what what did I get? What would they call you know hard time, man? You had a yeah. hard time since you were a kid. Throughout your life, man, you had a hard life. You had a hard time. And we're going to get into what you're doing, you know, now in a minute. But I want to talk more about now about your prison stay, about Ricky Fackrell and, you know, you know, gang 
affiliations. How old are you when you walk into prison now and, and you got this, you know, big sentence that you're getting ready to do? Uh, I'm, I'm 23. I just, uh, I just turned 23. So I turned 23 on September 23rd. October 6th is when I got caught. I just turned 23. 23, you're walking into prison. You just shot somebody. You're sentenced to five to life. In Utah, are you thinking, wow, I'm probably going to do 15. I'm going to do 20. What are you? What's going through your mind? At first, I wasn't sentenced. Okay? So I got, you know, I got these court hearings. I just know I got to find life with one to 15, and the feds are looking at me. And I'm thinking, damn, man, I'm hit. I'm done. There's nothing, there's nothing I can do. There's no defense. I can't. There's, there's going to be no defense because they found the gun. They have the victim. The victim identified me in the hospital because they had to take me to the hospital to fix my hand because I ripped my stitches out. They got the ballistics off my hand, the gunpowder residue, while I was asleep because I wouldn't let them do it. I was on one plate. I was on that bed fighting them. And uh, so I go in there, 23, and I don't even know how much time I'm going to do. I don't know what they're going to give me. But once you get sentenced, what are you thinking you're going to do once you're sentenced to five to life? I don't know what the laws are in Utah, but are you thinking in your head like, all right, I'm going to see the parole board in five. I'll probably get out or I'm going to see the parole board in 10 or I'm going to see them in five. And they're going to keep hitting me and I'm going to do 20 years. What, what's going through your mind after you know what your sentence is? OK, so after I know what my sentence is, the way a five to life works is you wait three years to go to the board. So. uh in that time, I'm like, damn, man, yeah, I'm. They're gonna, they're gonna give me a rehearing. I'm gonna go in there, and they're gonna be like, nah, come see me in, in ten years. That's what, that, that's what I'm thinking, you know, because I'm already a felon, and because I, I've had all these other charges, and because of my history in prison already being a, a jackass. So I'm, I'm really thinking that I'm gonna get a five to ten year rehearing, and uh. So uh, it's it's time to settle in. That's it's time to settle in. There's nothing I can do about it now. I can't get out, so I need to settle in. So you settle in. You're you're in you're in this prison, thinking, man, I'm probably gonna do at least 13 years before I can get out. I'm 23. You probably start adding it up, and it probably hurts a little bit, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. All my 20s gone. All your 20s. Some of the best years of your life forever gone. You can never reclaim them. They're gone. It's over. Uh, yeah. So now you get the prison, man. Do you tip up? Uh, do you, I mean, who? Uh, do, how is it? Are the white dudes on you? Like, yo, bro, what's up, man? Because I know it's heavily affiliated with Saw. It's affiliated with SAC. I mean, do any of these dudes um, approach you? So I had an uncle uh, who was a high-ranking member in Saw. Um, and he told me, he said, when you get to prison, just lay down, lick your nuts, and come home. Don't Don't get involved. And so my first two stays, I didn't get involved. I'm on this fight of life, and I don't get involved. I, I, I'm in there at, in 2004. October 14, 2004 is, uh, is when, I, when I got arrested or when I, when I went to prison, when I got to prison. And so uh, I go two and a half years. I believe two and a half years. Don't tip up. I fight. I'm fighting because I'm thinking now, now I'm in here. I got to fight my way to some kind of middle ground. So that way people will know that, Hey, he's willing to take an ass whooping, but at least he'll fight. Got to respect that. That was my mindset. And so that's what happened. And I got my ass whooped several times, but I don't tip up until I go to Max, I get out of Max, and uh, some shit goes down on the yard. And they was like, hey, man. And it's the white boys against against the Muslims. They're like, hey, man. I just got out of Max three days prior. The dudes are in the cell, and I was like, what's up, man? What's going on? And they're like, yeah, this dude, I was like, all right. Let me help you make these knives. So I help these dudes make these knives. And then they're like, well, the white boy, right? I was like, well, I'm not tipped up. I'm not a wood. 
but I'm coming with you guys because my skin's white, and and I'm 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 coming. So we get orders from a member from Saw. This is what's going to happen. This is who's going to work this area. This is who's going to work this area, and this is how it's going to go down. And it just so happens. I'm one of the dudes that have to walk behind the two dudes that are talking. One is one is a Muslim. The other dude is non-affiliate, but hangs out with the white dudes, eats with us, all that. My job is to carry this knife with one other dude and walk behind them as they're walking laps around the yard. And if at any time I feel that it's going to happen, that they're going to start fighting, or if they do start fighting, my job is to go up and start stabbing the Muslim, start cutting him, as well as this dude. And uh, walking those laps, I'm thinking, what are you doing? You're already on a fight of life. But I felt like I had something to prove. And I felt like this would help me. This would propel me into, into people leaving me alone. So I'm 6'2". I was a skinny dude, you know, 170 pounds, you know. Tall, skinny dude, and my mentality in there, I'm a goofy dude, and that's how I kept my, that's how I kept it the whole time. I didn't let him break my spirit. And so, because of that, I felt I had to defend myself, and I had to show these dudes that just because I act this way doesn't mean that I'm not down for myself and for my people. What happens? I mean, do they start fighting? Do you have to stab the dude? What happens? No. Fortunately, these dudes talk it out. And okay, when this happens, after the first lap, you got to understand, now there's now there's prison guards coming out. Now there's perimeter cops that circle the prison. There's perimeter trucks parked. The window on the tower is open. The guards in the, in the gym are standing outside. They don't do nothing. Everybody's at a standstill. They don't stop us. They don't, they don't nothing. And it's very tense. Everybody in this, there's a, a section of the prison that you can come out and stand on, on, the, on the ledge, on the landing, and uh, your doors don't lock. Everybody's out. They're watching this. And so we walk three laps. And uh, after the third lap, dude looks back at me and he's like, we're cool. And I was like, all right. So... I walk up to the dude that was calling the orders for the white boys in the first place. I got all the knives and I started breaking them down, shoving them in the dirt, throwing them in the other building, just getting rid of them. The cops disperse. Everything's cool. We'll go back to the unit. And the thing about it was the black dude was my friend. He was my friend. And after it all went down, seen him in the hall and I thought me and him were going to get at it because I felt like, you know, I was betraying him and I felt like he felt the same way. And he said, no, man, he said, I got more respect for you now because you did what you had to do for your people, regardless of who it was. So you don't end up, you don't end up tipping up with Saul. You end up doing something different, right? Well, so af after that incident, I get approached by Saul to be a probate. They want me to probate now because I built these knives for them. I didn't even know these dudes. I'd only been out of Max three days. I didn't know none of these dudes. But I helped them. And I'm telling them, no, no, no. And there's only a certain amount. Of, there's a, in, a window of when you can when you can start your probate. You can't just start at any time of the year. There's a, only, there's a certain amount of time. And when that window closes, you have to wait till the next year. And so the window's closing. So I feel pressured. And I tell him, I said, look, I'm still going to eat with black people. I'm still going to sit with black people. I'm still going to be friends with black people. When I smoke a cigarette, I'm going to smoke with black people. None of that's going to change. And if that's if, if that's not going to be allowed by you guys, by tipping up, then I'm not going to do it. And uh, he said, no, that's all good. You do what you, you do. What you do. And uh, so he convinced me to start probating. And so I start probating. And uh, I probated for three months. It's a six-month probate. I probated for three months, and I went to the drug program. And over in the drug program, there's no way I don't feel for me to uh, to show my worth or to, to show them that I'm down, to, to put in work. And so I say, you know what? I'm going to do this drug program to the best of my ability, and this can't be a part of it. 
So I go up to one of the generals that's over there in the drug program. And I tell I said, well, first I go to the dude that I'm under, who I'm probating under. And I tell him, I said, I don't want to probate anymore. And he's mad and he's heartbroken. He's pissed. And he's like, well, you go, to, <laughs> go, go talk to him. So I go over there and I talk to him and I tell him, I say, hey, man, look, man, I don't want to probate anymore. I said, it's no disrespect. And he's like, no, man. He's like, I got more respect for you now because there's so many of my brothers that have a patch on them that didn't have the balls to say they didn't want it. And there's so many patches covered up for that reason. The probate is for you to see if this is the lifestyle you want to live. And it's for us to see if you're capable of living this lifestyle. And you chose that this is not the lifestyle you want to live and ended your probate. So I got more respect for you. And that's coming from a general. You're probating. What are they having you do? Uh, when you probate, so uh, when you when you probate for SAC, it's different than when you probate for SAW. SAC is well known. SAC is very violent, very dangerous. SAC, it doesn't it doesn't matter. They they have established themselves and they've got their own yard and I mean they're doing it. So their probate is 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 violent. Saw probate saw is more reserved, more laid back, more chill. So in a saw probate, you don't have you you don't have to you're not going to they're not going to send you to stab somebody. They're just not. If a situation occurs and something needs to happen in that fashion, and you're there, they'll they'll send you. But they're not going to say, okay, here's a knife, go just stab this dude or go just stab that. They want you to, they want to see how you act around other people. They want to see your respect level, your intelligence. They want to see you educated. They want to see you making money. They want to see you having stuff in your cell and being able to provide for the other brothers. So in doing that, I took over the saw box. And the saw box, my job was to make sure it had soap, shampoo, deodorant, shoes. Uh, first hygiene, mandatory hygiene, all hygiene. Then came the shoes, the sweats, the luxury shit. But pretty much, first, pretty much, you're taking care of the new guys, guys that are coming in, guys that yeah. need stuff, guys that are down on their luck or whatever. Like you right. said, SAC is more of a dangerous gang, well established. Um, you ended up meeting Ricky Fackrell in Utah right. State Prison, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What was Ricky yeah. like as a young man? Because Man, let, let me say this for those that haven't seen the episodes first. Ricky Fackrell is, is a SAC gang member, Soldiers of Aryan Culture. He killed two different people in federal prison. Um, He used, you know, I, hey, man, it sounds crazy to get out here and say, hey, man, that dude was a good dude. And I've said this plenty of times where there are dudes that fucked their life off. And in my perspective, man, Ricky was a good dude who fucked his life off, man. And now he has the death penalty. So tell the people what Ricky was like before he was a prison killer. Uh, I'm just going to reiterate what you said. Ricky Fackrell was an amazing dude. Ricky Fackrell was my best friend. And yeah, we met in prison, but our, our relationship was not a prison relationship. Our relationship was from the heart. I felt he was my brother. I felt he was my younger brother. I was his older brother. And he acted goofy, just like me. He's a he was a goofy dude, running around, talking shit. I mean, just doing stupid dumb shit, man. And and I really like that because there wasn't there's not too many people like that in the in the joint. They all want to be serious and tough guys and all this shit. And I'm like, man, this is how I act on the streets. I'm gonna act the same way in here, you know? And uh he was the same way. And, you know, he was just a little guy, little dude. I mean, he was short and he was i guess he wasn't little little but he was you know average and uh he wasn't a gang member he had no part of sack he had no part of racism he had no none of that he was just a young dude that got caught up on some shit and uh but make no bones about it if there was a situation and he had to fight, he would fight. And I respected that because that's the way I was. 
kick my ass. I don't care. I'm not going to look bad if you kick my ass. You know what I mean? If you're going to kick my ass, I'm going to come out of that cell and I'm going to stay in the section. Same with him, you know? And so we kind of, we stuck together. Did everything together. Did you ever imagine that he would become a dude that goes to federal prison? He becomes part of SAC. I don't know if it was in the state or in the feds, but eventually you two get separated. He goes to the hole for something. You never see him again. Would you have ever thought that he would become a SAC gang member and kill two people in prison? No. Absolutely not. No, man. <laughs> Ricky Thacker was just a drug addict from a little tiny town in Utah. In the middle of nowhere, it's an oil town. There's oil rigs out there. That's where he comes from. And uh, from Vernal, Utah. No. Never. So you're watching my videos. I don't know you. You don't know me. Last night, I guess, is your first experience with uh, Blood on the Razor Wire TV on YouTube. And you see Ricky Fackrell on there. Are you shocked? Like, oh, what? It was this morning. I seen your... I hit YouTube on my TV. This morning, I seen your video for the very first time. Never seen your videos before. It was five most dangerous prison gangs. And I was intrigued by it. I watched that kind of shit all the time. So I listened. And then you mentioned Ricky Sacro. And my heart, my heart hurts, man. My heart's broke. Because that was my, <laughs> that was my dude, man. That was my, <laughs> that was my dude. That's all there is to it. And I'm looking on here and I see him and I see him with all these tattoos and I'm looking at the TV and he's got sack on him and I'm taking pictures of him. And I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck, man? And like you said in the video, they're going to strap my dude, my best friend to a fucking table and your words put poison in his veins and kill him. And my best friend's going to be gone forever. Yeah. Last time. Go ahead. Sometimes you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And, you know, there's people watching the videos, man, and I want them to, to know what it feels like, man, to to be this young, goofy, white kid that goes to prison. Could be Spanish kid, could be a black kid, African-American kid, Mexican kid. Go to prison, man, never expecting that you will never walk out a free man again, that this will be your life. You go in there for five years, and now you end up with a death penalty. And it is... It's, it's discerning, man. It's heartbreaking to see, you know, these young kids go to prison. And I'm just going to call it how it is. Some people might get mad. But some of these dudes are trying, like you said, trying to prove something to people who are really a bunch of nobodies, man. You're trying oh. to prove something to a bunch of nobodies. Yeah. Those nobodies ended up putting Ricky in a position where he kills the first dude with his dude. And then he goes on and kills another dude in the hole. And these dudes put these dudes in these positions where now their lives are over with. You know what I mean? Like you're looking up to the big homie and he's not willing to do the shit that you were just willing to do. He's not willing to go kill someone and end up with a death penalty, but yet they'll send you on a mission to go do that. Sad, isn't it? Absolutely. That's And that's how I seen it with, with Sack and Saw. And, uh, you know, and, and in my heart, I, that wasn't, I'm not that person. I'm not racist. I'm not a racist person. Never, never have been. And I knew I was doing something wrong the whole time I was probating. And I feel that Ricky felt the same way inside because I knew him. I knew Ricky Fackle, the young goofy kid. So I got to see what he was really like before all that. And I got to, I got to imagine that as he's going through it, he's thinking, why did I do this? These dudes, these dudes don't give a fuck about me. They ain't put money on my books. They're not having people come visit me. They're not writing me letters. But here I am supporting them with their fucking, with their patch on me and kill somebody. And then here I go. I'm going to go die. And I'm just going to be talked about as, damn, he was crazy. He killed two dudes. And then they fucking murked him. You know, he's probably laying in his cell Right now in New York, it's 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon. He's probably laying in his cell right now. They're going to do the count at four. He's probably got his legs kicked up on the wall. He's probably staring at the ceiling like, damn, man. Today could be the day where he's like, wow, man. My life's over, man. This is it. Forever gone. Forever lost. Sad, man. Yeah, absolutely. 
Uh, I can't. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine being on death. I just can't imagine it because because the lifestyle I lived for twenty eight years was not me. It wasn't me. It was at first. It was survival. I had to do what I had to do for food, for a place to sleep, because I had nowhere to go, and I wouldn't stay in foster homes. But then it turned into an addiction, and that addiction just perpetuated the lifestyle that I lived, and I was stuck in it, and I hated every minute of it. I, I didn't love it. Even in the good times of the addiction, I didn't, I didn't love it, because the person I am today is the person I've always had inside me. You know, so I feel that he's feeling the same way. Let me ask you this. You end up becoming a crip in prison, right? You get yeah. away from Saw and you become a crip. We're not yeah. going to go too far into it, but how? what was it like for a white dude to be a crip in Utah? And you're from California, bro. You're from right. Fresno, home of the Bulldogs, but you yeah. end up becoming a crip in, in Utah. So tell me a little bit about that. All right, so uh, the crip gang that that – I was affiliated with uh, their their bylaws. The way they treat each other was the way I felt people should treat each other. If you didn't have food, here's food, and it, nothing back, nothing back, other than respect. You're not going on a, you're not going on a mission, and you don't have to go stab nobody. You're just gonna act right. You're gonna walk the line. You walk the line, you're good others to it and uh so i started hanging out with these dudes all the time and i was 32 when i became a crip and uh because i, I really felt i really felt that these dudes genuinely cared and because of when i got a violation it wasn't stomping me out and beating the hell out of me. That's not what they wanted to do. They ain't trying to hurt me. They're trying to educate me. They're trying to teach me. And so the violations that they give out are, depends on what it is, but uh, it's not necessarily getting your ass whipped. But the SAC dudes operate that way, right? Saw. Oh. The saw operate yeah. that way if you violate? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 hands-on. So, um, so these white dudes have no problem violating their own people like, beating the shit. And I mean, that's what happened with, with Ricky Fackrell. It was one of the sack homeboys violated some of the rules, was getting high or whatever. And they decided, hey, we're going to fuck this dude up and they kill him. This is their homeboy. Yeah. The dude they were eating with. The dude they were hanging out with. You know, yesterday they were right. doing burpees together. Today they're stabbing him to death. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, that's... It's wild, man. And, uh, you know, the the gang that I joined, they, they weren't like that. However, let me explain something to you. you. Being a white crip in Utah, there's other gangs. There's there's Tongan gangs that are crips. Uh, there's uh, other crips from other states here in Utah. Um, and even crips in the hood that I was involved with weren't necessarily cool with white people being crips because crips was a black thing supposed to be a black thing uh and with no I, i'm just saying that because that's the way i was oh grew up and that's what that's what you were taught that's what you perceived and, yeah. and you know something i'm from new york i thought the same thing like that's a black gang the bloods are a black gang and right. when i get to prison i see that things are a little bit different but you know yeah. i always thought that too until i got to prison but go ahead yeah and so you know uh for some people they didn't they didn't like it but they respected it you know what I mean? But they weren't, they weren't all up. We weren't locked in seas, you know, all day long, whatever, kicking it, arms on the shoulder, you know. But when it was time to rack in or whatever, you you know, they lock seas, they say goodnight, they respect you, you eat together still. Uh but other than that, they just, you know, they're not, they don't like it. They respect how, how about the white dudes now? Are they looking at you like the sack dudes like dude's a race trader, man's a piece of shit? How are they looking at you? Yeah, uh, it happened. Uh, when I got kicked out of the drug program, I went on a, a, a tier, and there was probably six patch holders for SAC 
and a bunch of nut riders. And so, and I'm living with the black game. And so I'm going to work every day in the kitchen. Well, this one dude starts some shit, man. And they talk to this saw dude. And, uh, and this is after I've already dropped my probate and everything. Uh, everything's good on my end like that. But now I got to, I got to watch my back because some of these saw members ain't going to like that. These sack members ain't going to like that. that I've, I've bowed out of my pro, my probate. So I got to watch my back every day because I don't have nobody to watch me. You know what I mean? And so I'm going to work every day and I'm just minding my own business, man. I'm just going to work. I'm coming back. I'm going to my cell, chilling. I'm not really coming out. I'm not talking to many people because I'm not, I'm not going to give these sack members a reason to book me, stab me. Well, one of these dudes that kicks it with him starts running his mouth. So he tells a saw member, a high ranking saw member that, you know, he thinks I'm a bitch or, or whatever. He, he talks to him, but this dude tells a oh boy, he says, well, I think he'll fight. So if that's the way you feel, you guys both work in the kitchen. I don't think he's a punk bitch or a lay. You guys both work in the kitchen. Go handle it. I had no idea this conversation took place. I go to work and I'm, I'm pacing back and forth and he's mugging me, mugging me. And finally, I, I, I snapped, dude. I walked over to him. I was like, what's up, man? You got a fucking problem? We can go in the bathroom. We can fucking handle it. Get it taken care of. Whoop my ass or I whip your ass and get it fucking done, dude. But I'm not going to fucking sit here and walk on eggshells. I'm done with it. So what do you want to do? He's like, look, man, I, I really, you know, uh, and I told him, I said, here, let me help you. I want to go home. I have a parole day. I don't want to lose that. I'm sure you want to go home too. This is some bullshit hearsay from the other side of the prison in the drug program. And you don't even know what the fuck you're talking about. But you're starting shit. So we squash it. And uh, I go back and the dude he talked to told me, he's like, hey, did you, did old boy hit you up today? I said, no, I hit him up. He's like, really? And so he tells me the story. That's how I find out that that conversation took place. I'm glad and after that. that. Go ahead, Brian. I'm sorry. And after that, you know, I could, after that, I started coming out of my cell. I started walking around. I started talking to people more because they see now that, and this dude's big dude, he works out. They see now that I don't care. Is he going to disrespect me? You can make me feel this way. Let's get it over with. Just Sometimes. You know, here's a jewel for you, man. Sometimes we can't fix the things that we won't face. You can't, you know, you can't fix it if you won't face it. So you faced it. It took a while. You got tired of it. You, you, you're like, yo, man, it's whatever, bro, because I'm not going to walk around here like a hermit just staying in my cell like I'm a lame. What's up? You, you got a problem, man? Let's handle it. If I get transferred, I get transferred. It, it is what it is, right? Yeah. But eventually, you get out of prison, and you got a wedding ring on? I do. So now... You're out of prison. You change your life, obviously. What are you doing with your life now? So uh, I get out of prison and I'm living at this hotel, working there as a night manager. I got my own apartment in the hotel. And uh, and it's a tiny town. The town's only got 300 people in it. And so, uh, and there's a lake real close by, about 10 minutes away. And I go there all the time in my little truck that I bought, my little beater truck. Got my fishing pole, my beater truck, my fishing license. I'm on parole. I'm tiny town. I'm good. And I take pictures. I like to take pictures. I like photography. So I took some pictures and I posted them on their little, the little uh, Scipio Town connector, their little, their little page. I posted them on it. And uh, this girl, she, she commented on them. She said, those are beautiful pictures. And I said, thank you. And she said, you're welcome. And I thought she was hitting on me. <laughs> and so what do I do? I send some more pictures to her and we start talking. And uh, she lives in the same town. <laughs> Are you serious? You got to be fucking kidding me. So after we talked for probably a week, I said, hey, you want to come over to the hotel? You know, you can come kick it. You can meet me, whatever. Yeah, cool. I meet her. We kick it. She starts coming to the hotel. She asked me if I want to meet her son. I said, absolutely. He's two years old at the time. I go up there. It's dark. I go up to her parents' house where she's staying with her kids. I got him on my lap, man. 
and he's pointing at the moon, and he can't talk very well. He's pointing at the moon, and he's trying to say star, and the little shithead farts on me. And she's like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I was like, no, he's cool, man. He's cool. You know what I mean? And we're laughing about it. He's giggling. Talking to him, talking to her. And he does it again. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is my dude right here. I don't care what anybody says. I don't give a fuck what happens. This is my dude. And um, I met her in July. Uh, I met her in July. And we got married in November of last year. Not last, not. 21 but in 20 okay so are you happy yeah absolutely uh, yeah you feel like you have a purpose in life now absolutely i've always felt like i had a purpose in life i just couldn't break the chain i couldn't break through but my wife and kids have saved my life dude that's all there is to it no matter the, no matter the conflict me and my wife go through no matter the, the struggles that we've been through together no matter any of that ask you this are you done with drug addiction i mean no suboxone no weed no nothing or yeah. what tell me what's going on uh i don't i don't i don't do any drugs i don't do any drugs at all uh i'm not on suboxone i'm not on i'm not on anything like that uh i had some lower tabs for my back my back's fucked up but i only get a prescription for 30 days and then i'll stop it until if it's really fucked up then i'll go to my doctor and Working? Are you working? Uh, I'm a stay-at-home dad. My wife, uh, she works at a fertility clinic, uh, and my my work history is is I don't have one. Um, my my education level is some college. I graduated high school in prison. I graduated a culinary arts program, um, but my my life skills out here don't have them. I'm learning. I'm, I've only been out of prison for 29 months. Uh, and I'm learning. So my option was to get a job at the gas stations around here. But if I got to get a job at the gas station, all that's going to do is pay for daycare. So we talked to my parole officer, got it approved. I'm a stay-at-home dad, and my wife goes to work, and I door dash. So me and my boy go door dashing all the time. That's what's up, man. You door dash, you make some money. Some people make really good money doing that. But the the important thing is, man, is that you're a dad, you're a father, you're a husband, and like you said, man, it's a work in progress. You're learning. But you know what? I commend you, bro. I commend you for getting out of prison, going through the shit that you went through. You probably, from everyone that I talk to, I've talked to some people with some hard lives. But the shit that you've been through, you are pro you probably had the hardest life out of all of us. I, th I thought I had a hard life. You know, my father was a drug addict and my brother killed himself. And But you know what, bro? The shit that you've been through, you've been through it, man. And you just got to keep pushing. And there might be some days where you feel like you're falling down the mountain. But guess what? You're only falling a little way, man. And then you got to work your way back up. And this is where you were at when you fell. And then tomorrow you're going to be here. And you just keep pushing. You fall down, you keep climbing, man. Don't ever forget that. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, I have a hard time believing that I am the person I am today. I have a hard time believing that I have a home, a wife, two kids. I'm well, if you, if you don't. If you don't believe it, no one else will. You better believe it. Well, what I'm saying is, okay, I'm having a hard time believing my past that I did that for 28 years and then now here I am today, you know, because the 28 years I spent dreaming of what I wanted, thinking of how I wanted to live, thinking of what I wanted in my life and how I wanted to do it. And now it's, now it's really coming true. Like the things are... Are, are coming true that I wanted in my life. And uh, it's, it's, it's difficult when you spent your life as a drug addict and in prison and to get out here and try to uh, integrate with society and not being able to um, relate to people out here and not being able to um, have things in common. And all my stories were prison stories when I first got out of prison. So when somebody would talk to me, the only way I could relate to them was to add the prison to it and say, well, this, yeah, this is how we did it in prison or this, you know what I mean? And now that I've been out for 29 months, I'm not talking that way very much anymore. My, my, vo my vocabulary is better. 
my uh, approach with with people is better. I still I still struggle with going into restaurants. I still struggle with going into stores because I'm covered in tattoos from head to toe, except on my face. And uh, so I still struggle with that kind of stuff because I feel like people are looking at me like he's stealing something or damn he's a he's a horrible person. And really, you know, I'm not. Listen, listen to me, Brian. Struggle no more, man. Believe in yourself. Know who you are. Know what your worth is. Know that today you're a father. You're a husband. You know, you might be an ex-convict, but today you're so much more than you used to be. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. Gonna, I'm going to get ready to close the show, man. But before we go, is there anything you'd like to say, man? What would you tell your younger self, man? What would you tell a, a kid, man, that was 12 years old, whose mother was out and about, man, leaving him in, you know, certain places. And he's struggling right now, man. He's 12 years old. He's 14 years old. He's 15. What message do you have for him or for your son? The message, my my message to situations like that is to seek help. Because no matter how bad you think you have it, no matter how bad you feel you've done to others, no matter, there's somebody out there that's willing to help you. And if you're struggling with drug addiction at a very young age, you need to find some help to save your life or you're going to end up like me or even worse, like Ricky Fackler. You know, these dudes go on a little bid two years and end up with life and death. And the drugs you're doing today are going to lead you to that. If you don't die in prison, you're going to die on the streets. Make something of yourself. Have a life. We don't want guys to end up like Ricky Fackrell, and we don't want people to go down the road that you went to before you finally say, hey, you know what? This is what I really want to be. This is what I really want to do. And this is who I really am. I'm a different person, man. But um, yeah. Brian, man, I appreciate you coming on the show, sharing your stories, sharing your experiences, man. I hope that it helps someone. I hope that it lights, you know, turns on that light bulb upstairs for someone today. You know what I mean? So definitely appreciate you coming on, bro. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to communicate a little more. We probably might end up doing a part two if you're, if you're up for that, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely appreciate you, man. Keep being the dude that you are today, man, and not the dude that you used to be. So, with respect, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Until tomorrow, we're out.